All right, it is Friday and that might mean FNA Friday, but today it's going to be a q and It's going to be part four of Q&A answers because people submitted some questions. So let's get straight to the questions and I will do my best to answer them and hopefully it will be helpful. And of course, if you have any more questions regarding the answers, let me know in the comments. All right. All right. Let's move over here. So Z is asking, hey, GD, I hope you're having an awesome start to the year. It's been pretty awesome so far. My question is, how do you transition to a VFX animation studio after learning animation for studios like Disney or Sony that has stylized animation? That's a good question. I can't really answer that in terms of experience because I have stayed um, at a realistic studio for now 15 years. Um, that being said, what you would have to do is you would have to prepare a reel that is fitting for that company. So you would have to find obviously uh, exercises and ideas that fit that style. So like you said, something that's more stylized, but that also means that you're gonna have to create a brand new reel that will fit that company. And you have to go through exercises and kind of look at what is that company doing in terms of work. So is it performance heavy, which most of the times it is. So you'd have to look at something that covers body mechanics, just to show that you can do body mechanics in a stylized fashion with the right timing, but then also just a lot of performance driven work, I would say. How important is having a separate creature animation reel with four or five shots, as opposed to having one or two in your stylized animation reel? Well, the thing is, if you have a stylized animation reel, I would be careful with creature animation um, if it's more on the realistic side, because it's, it's something that they might look at and go, well, that's cool, I like this, but it's not what we do, so it's not really fitting. So if you do creature shots, um, I always tell my students, look at um, Ratatouille, where it's a lot of creature behavior, that the way the rats move is that you can tell that there's so much study behind it in terms of just the, the little features with the nose, the sniffing, the movements the, the, on four legs, but then it goes back onto two legs and then they are acting like humans. So it's an interesting mix of performance and creature uh, observation and then putting in, in those skills into, the, into your shot. So if you say, how important is having a separate animation reel? I would say have a separate reel that is for realistic creature work for realistic companies. And if you do a, a feature reel for, you know, Pixar, Sony and all that good stuff, then you would have specific performance shots and everything is stylized. But you can add creatures to that reel and just have their performances be stylized. Or even if it's just a mechanics thing, I would just add some character to it. It's kind of a behavior, they're looking for something or, you know, there's some conflict they have to overcome, but everything in a stylized fashion. So, you know, you look at Coco and the dog, you look at Up and there's the dog. I mean, there's there are many examples and obviously go to other companies and you have Rio. There's just so many companies that have shown um, stylized creature animation. So I would look at that for reference. All right, I think that is it. Um, Thanks again, you're awesome. Well, thank you, you're awesome for reading and commenting. Uh, let's go to the next question. Maurizio Bartok. Bartok, Bartok, isn't that a, a Klingon in Deep Space Nine? Maybe Next Generation? Bartok, sounds very familiar. Hi, Jean-Denis, are you able to work 24 frames per second at work? What kind of tricks do you use to deal with slow rigs? So we are able, but we also have to because the work that we do at work is at 24 frames per second. If it would change to 30 or 60, depending on the uh, director's style, or if it's maybe something that's more game related or VR or whatever it is, um, then we would just switch and yes, we would have to do it depending on what the client is asking for. Uh, and what kind of tricks do you use um, to deal with slow rigs? It's a tricky thing. <laughs> I'm sure there, there are tricks. Sometimes some rigs are so heavy that you can't screw up, you can't do anything. If you screw up, you've got to wait a couple seconds and then it updates and it gets very, very difficult where um, you can't really proof watch your animation. You just have to make play blasts all the time. And then when that happens, then I take notes. Okay, so I see that the, the play blast in real time, the movement is in real time. And then I take notes to see, hmm, this and this and this, this is not working. And then in order to animate it when you can't scrub and it's slow, uh, I just go on specific frame numbers for posing. Uh, and then you just get a play blast and check the timing. It's not always that slow, but it can happen. Uh, and it's especially tricky when you have uh, facial animation. So then I go to the graph editor because I can scrub, I can hear the sound. Uh, and then depending on what the, what the line is, I just hit S for now, 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 for when the jaw opens and kind of massage it. Because after a while, after having done a couple of shots, you kind of recognize the curves in the graph and you kind of know what it's going to look like. So you can do some pretty somewhat okay crappy um, first pass 
and then you again you do the the play blast and then you look at it okay i gotta do this i gotta do that and you start putting in um, you know eye blinks and facial shapes and it's just very tedious it's just very slow so i don't i don't know if there's a a, a trick that deals with it but for me there are ways to get it still done it's just slow but there are just there are just ways um now there's Maya 2019 that just came out that apparently caches animation. I haven't quite looked into this, but, but supposedly it's it's helpful. Uh, so I want to look into that. And I don't know if you know if ILM if the company's going to do that. I can't speak on the company's behalf. Plus I would have to vet it through PR. So I'm not going to mention anything that we do in terms of you know tools and specific tricks. Um, but that's kind of it. Uh, and uh, thank you. Well, thank you too. Thank you for commenting here. All right. Next up is Siva Shankar. Siva, Shiva, Siva. My quest of this eon is, will you ever show us all on how you do your blocking and take it to the final polishing stage of a shot? Yes. Can you show us how you do it? Yes, practically. Even if it's just the post to post transformation, it will really help us all goofballs. Yes, the answer is yes. Uh, and I will definitely go from beginning to the end where you start with the bouncing ball and you start then with walks and then body mechanics, and performances. And it won't just be post to post. I do want to do um, a full pass. So I'm going to try to, you know, have the shots not be too long. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to animate them. And I'm still debating if I should just record the whole thing, post it in real time, or slightly spit up. I'm not quite sure because I'm thinking about animating and then commenting and, and giving you a, a thought process. You know, like, oh, I'm doing this because of that, blah, blah, blah. It'll be very long and potentially very boring. But why not? Maybe someone wants to see the actual real-time process. But once that is done, I want to take that whole clip and then cut it up and just do bullet points and then show this is what I did for this, then the end result, and maybe a before and after, and then with, with written bullet points. So I'm going to do something that's obviously much shorter, where you just get the main lessons out of it. But if someone is interested in watching the whole progress uh, and process in real time, I'm probably going to do that. But I see people post that and then it's kind of sped up maybe twice the normal speed or maybe three times faster and then also with text so i'm still kind of debating and maybe you can comment maybe you can let me know um what you prefer i uh, definitely the bullet point shorter version but on the long version do you want to see full on real time slightly sped up with voice over i don't know i feel like if i do it real time and i comment exactly when i do something that it might be more helpful also it would force me to be more economical and actually not hurry but not noodle around and kind of watch a play blast for hours and hours and hours. So it might be a good thing for me as well to kind of be more streamlined and focus on that. Anyway, but that's kind of, that's the idea. So yes. All right, Le Mainstream. Hey JD, so I'm not a new subscriber. I've actually been here for a while, but I'll still give you my questions. Hope that's okay. That's totally fine, of course. I've been teaching myself animation for a year now. I created two short films, one as an application movie for, an, for a university here in Europe, the second one for an exam that I had to take in the second round of said application exam. I'm trying it again in February. I've been busy for one and a half year creating short films for the university and have learned a lot, but the footage, it ain't the best thing for a short film. By the way, I'm reading all this just in case people are watching, uh, not watching, they're listening to this clip and not watching it, so I'm reading it aloud. Now to my three questions. Let's say, God forbid, I will be rejected once again. How would you suggest that a self-taught animator should go about to get hired? Any tips, suggestions? It's a good question. Self-taught animator. I think the biggest thing is, well, as you know, as you being self-taught, you got to find ways to expand your skill sets. You got to go through a list of exercises just to practice and just to get better. And you go through the mechanics and gestures and facial stuff and, you know, performance and all that stuff. And I have an FNA, uh, a previous clip that talks about exercises and people have commented as well with, with their ideas. So the tips would be a practice, keep practicing, which you're doing since you're self-taught, but then I would put them, um, I would put them online, meaning Facebook groups, Facebook in general, Twitter, um, Instagram, wherever you can post something, uh, and then forums also. I think I t I ask something about animation feedback in my tweets. I will post that tweet as well, where people have commented with lots of places where you can post your reel. But my point is you post online so people see it. Because the thing is, if it's a good shot, and my, my chair is creaking, I gotta get a new chair. 
if the shots are good, right, stuff will spread, people will share it, and people will see it, and maybe people in places will, in places where they can hire people, will share it at their company, and then that might get attention, and you might get hired that way. So, I mean, that's one way um, that could work. I'm not saying it's a surefire fire thing, but that's on top of just sending in your reel to all the companies, whether they post we're hiring or not. Sometimes the hiring process is kind of overlapping. Maybe when they posted we're hiring, they just found someone. So, I mean, definitely pay attention when a company says we're hiring, but at the same time, just send it anyway. And every six months or so, I would just send something new. And I wouldn't send a reel that's like 80% the same, and then just one more shot or two more shots are new. Uh, I would just really overhaul the reel and then resend it. Um, so a self-taught animator to get hired, I mean, it all comes down to your reel. So keep practicing, make your reel better, um, solicit feedback in those forms so that you get critiques, so you don't just animate in a vacuum, and then keep applying. Um, so a lot of times, so many times, it's all about timing. You might have a great reel, but then the timing's off and they can't really hire you. Um, so that would be my, <clears throat> those would be my suggestions. Two, so I've been already looking for jobs, internships, and found something called the Game Dev Map, which is pretty useful for people that are trying to find places to get an internship job in the game industry. In the game industry, I was wondering if anybody heard from anything similar for animation studios. Ah, oh, that's right, you're the one that asked that question that prompted my tweet with all those answers. So I'm gonna post that in the description, and I believe I posted it also in the comment section of the clip where I asked that you send me questions but I will post it again in this clip just in case people missed that one. So people have responded with a lot of places. So for people watching and listening, check the description. It's in there. I'm gonna to link to that tweet with those answers. Three, you keep giving some cool examples of scenes to animate to put in the show reel. Thank you. What are things that, are, that a noob should have or things to keep in mind to focus on? Well, in a reel, the reel to me needs to show variety. I mean, obviously your reel needs to be tailored towards the company. So, you know, when you just do all creature work and, it, uh, and the reel is for a company that does performance, then, you know, that doesn't really apply. Generally, I would say, you obviously want to show that you can animate. So a full body mechanic shot that shows weight shifts and a walk and a tumble or something with weight. So weight and body mechanics need to be on there for sure. But that I would, I would do that on a full body that, so that you can see the whole thing. But then you can transition to pantomime. I would do a pantomime where you do acting and do performance, but not with the help of audio, right? So it's just pantomime. But that would also be full body. And then you can get closer to, uh, you know, maybe that type of framing of the way I'm framed here in this clip. Um, and this could be within cuts, so you can have a sequence of multiple shots, or the character is far away and comes closer to the camera, and then you can show full body and more closer, um, close up acting. Uh, and then performance, so lip sync. And I think every time I move now, my chair does a crack. <clears throat> so lip sync, uh, and then you would show different types of emotions. So you can do a lip sync where the character's performance is, you know, very exaggerated and maybe very happy, and then very angry and very sad and a bit more subtle. So to me, that's just kind of the variety aspect of it. Um, and then, if possible, I know it's tricky and I want to actually post something soon about using creatures on your reel for cartoony purposes, but they're not that many, um, I'm not super aware, but I need to do more research, but they're not, they're not as many creature reels online, style as cartoony with really great facial setups compared to what's out there human, uh, human-wise, in, in a rig. Um, but I would try to have humans and creatures on your reel and definitely humans where they're old and young and bigger and skinnier, um, you know, and just, you know, male, female and whatever you want so that you show that you can apply your, your talents and your skills and your observations and your, and, do, and your sense of humor and everything that you can do as an animator, but you can apply this to different characters. Um, yeah, if you happen to have only one, one character rig, then I would try to really change up the shot so that each shot is a completely different character. So one, it's the same rig though. So one would be very arrogant, it's, it's a stupid example. So someone would be very ar arrogant and then next show would be the, the same rig, but the character is very shy and introverted. And it's also interesting to show that even though it's the same rig, it's a completely different character. And if you can show that off, that's also cool. So if you have multiple rigs and different rigs, cool for variety. If you have only one and you're only used to one and for some, whatever reason you can only use one, then just focus on showcasing different characters, then it's also impressive to see because then you transcend the look of the rig and it's just all you, all your skills at this point. Hope that makes sense. Um, and I'm so pumped for what you have coming up for 2019. Me too, I got plans. I've been waiting for some book recommendations. Yes, that's coming. Um, 
keep, up, keep that good work up. Well, thank you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you too. And thank you uh, from all of us for sharing these amazing pieces of information that bring us closer to our dream jobs. I hope, I hope I'm somewhat helpful um, in moving people forward. Uh, and if not, I apologize for wasting your time, but I'm trying my best. Uh, but yes, thank you. Thank you for the submit here. All right, just Zeno. Just Zeno? Zeno, Zeno. How long did it take you to start working? Uh, hold on, how long did it take you for start working on the industry? I know what you mean. From day one of animating your first animation to working on a company, I actually replied to this um, specifying if it's the first time I animated in general or an actual exercise. Uh, and I say this because I've done at the Academy, let's say as a kid, I did flip books, a little bit of pixel art type of animation type of thing, but you know, horrible, obviously. Uh, and then nothing. And then I came to the Academy and then I did a uh, Star Wars-y thing using Bryce and I think it's on my website if you want to look at it. Uh, and then I took Maya 1 and 2, but that was just something that I did. We didn't really, the teacher wasn't really teaching animation. It was more, here's how you model, this is how you rig, this is how you do texturing. It wasn't very really animation specific. The first class was Maya 3 uh with lisa mullins and that was the first class with actual exercises where she was explaining the principles and that's kind of what i'm looking at in terms of an answer that's the first class where i actually had an exercise a proper exercise uh and that was fall 2002 yes and then i graduated in uh spring 2003 so two semesters basically of animation so fall 22 that would start in September, so uh, fall 2002. September usually starts. That's probably when, if you want to specifically the dates or day one. So somewhere in September. <clears throat> then I graduated in May 2003. Did uh, submit my reel. Did some more stuff uh, at home. Took one more class in fall, and then got hired uh, January 26th, with which is tomorrow. Tomorrow it's 15 years that I've been animating. Uh, I'll do a clip about that. Uh, so from day one, September 2002, I would say, to January 26, 2004, that's when I started. So that's kind of, that's my timeline. Hope that makes sense. All right, thank you. Xavier Robertson. Hello, JD. I have a question in animating in eye care FK. Majority of animators in the industry I've spoken to say they use FK for everything and only us IK or use IK for when the hand need, needs to be still. But I've seen the workflow of a couple animators and I think I remember you saying you only use IK. Kinda. Yes, and kinda. And to add on to this, the people that use IK don't really use the graph editor only. The Euler filter from time to time, but the majority of FK users swear by the graph editor. I'm not sure about you, I'll get to that. I know that the reason majority use FK is because or, uh, or of arcs and more precision, but I've seen the work produced by the IK animators. It is at the studio level of quality, so they know what they're doing. What is your take on IK versus FK? So I got a couple of tricks about how to make IK look like FK, because it's a common thing um, that animators uh, at schools face, where it just looks too much like an IK arm. Uh, so that's gonna be a separate clip for sure. That's gonna be an F and A. Uh, in general, so my view is, crack, crack my chair. Because at work, again, I can't <clears throat> say too much because it's work, but we use rigs. I mean, they can switch between IK FK, but at the very beginning, they were heavy, heavy IK rigs. And I studied at school FK, but then uh, the company was IK, but the tools are really good. And just the way it's set up in IK is really interesting. Uh, also in terms of um, having minimal control. So it's not like five spine controllers, but you can rotate and transit at the same time, but it takes the whole spine with it. So you get a nice pose just using one controller, which is really neat. And then you still have an inner controller to make more um, changes without affecting arms. So this, it's a setup is just really good. Um, and that's why I fell into more the IK look of it, not the, the, the process of it. But sometimes it's better and faster. It's definitely faster to post things out. It's definitely slower when you want arcs. It's a pain. So you got to track your arcs or, you know, use whatever tricks you can have. Or in this case, you just switch between IK and FK. So there are ways. Um, now you're saying that they don't really use a graph editor. I don't use it when the rig is heavy because there's just something about the delay and I can't scrub where I'm faster looking at the render view 
and then posing my changes out and not changing the pose or the timing in the graph editor. So my, my pose changes on specific frames will change the timing and I put offsets in there. So I don't do offsets in a graph editor, I, I put in the offset in the actual pose. That's because this, the rig is slow. If the rig is fast, then I go to the graph editor, but because most rigs are slow, I mean, they're not super slow, but I'm just mostly posing it out. But if it's something at home or something faster, like I said, um, then you just push play and then look at what's going on and then can adjust in the graph editor and kind of compare. Uh, so then I'll gravitate more towards the graph editor. Um, the Eula filter, I use that just because of gimbal and doing crazy, you know, spinning and stuff where I want to fix the arc. So uh, I wouldn't say, IK only Euler. I don't know. I mean, I checked the Euler, you know, the, the flipping of curves and, and the, the gimbal and stuff and then apply that filter. Um, but how do they make it work? I mean, the thing is, ultimately, whatever you use, FK or IK, it's your 2D shot on flat surface, you know, the, the 2D visuals still has to be the same whether you use IK or FK. So whatever tools you can have to track your arcs to make it look like, I mean, you're, you're professional, hopefully, uh, at work, get higher because you're professional or you're you're good enough to, you know, be considered professional, uh, you will make it work. So I wouldn't say if you're using only FK, then you're professional. And if you use a lot of IK, you're not. And you mean like, I don't know, to me, the, the whole distinction between uh, well, animators can do studio level quality. Well, it doesn't matter what your tools are and how your process is. The end result still has to be the same. And you got higher because you have those skills. Um, so it just comes down to, I would say personally, it comes down to your workflow and your preferred process. What is easier for you, what you prefer. Um, but for me, it's also what does the shot dictate? So if a character is sitting and all they're doing is dangling their legs, I'm going to switch those legs to, IFK, uh, to, to FK so that I can dangle the legs. Because arcs like this uh, in IK is a pain. So it just all depends what the shot is asking for. So if it's very you know, small, subtle things, lots of arcs, FK will be better, but if it's holding on to things in fights and stuff like that, where they're tumbling around, then I will switch to IK because to me, that setup is easier. I hope this answers the question. I hope so. As always, let me know. Comment if I was an idiot and it's not clear, I will answer again uh, via uh, comment. All right. Yanif, Yanif Nemet. Yanif, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Extremely excited for future content, especially demos. Me too! Also with the demos, I like it because since I'm gonna show it, I'm not gonna be like I said, noodling around. It forces me to be a bit more professional and be more organized. But I definitely have shots where I just kind of fool around. I mean, it's mostly at home because I got time. Uh, but I like this. I like the pressure of doing a demo and then showing it. Uh, but anyway. I have recently gone through an advanced body mechanics program similar to Animation Mentor before turning 18. Good for you, young. I'm now doing my best to improve my drawing skills in order to apply for animation college. Here's my question. What is your view on animation bachelor degrees for someone who is certain he is going to pursue a 3D animation career? Interesting. Well, it depends. I used a bachelor and I needed a bachelor because of my work visa. Getting a, a, a work visa, an H1B at that point, was better, it was easier, I don't say it's easier, but the process was just helped by having a bachelor degree and it was even better to have a master's degree. I mean, these were the guidelines back then, again, it's like 15 years ago. So it really depends. If you don't need a degree wherever, you know, if you don't need to apply for work visa and you, you are a citizen there, uh, then I wouldn't say you need a bachelor's degree, you just need a good reel. I mean, however you get to that reel is up to you. You can go to a school, uh, you can use online schools, or you can just be self-taught. It just depends on your, do you have the money to pay for the schools, but they're expensive? Um, so to me, it's more of that. Like, where are you placed and where can you go to apply? And you need to go to a different country. And then you need to look at the work visa requirements and maybe bachelor degrees is part of that. And what animation college or university schools do you recommend the most for a 3D animator can study in the US since it's so expensive? There you go. So here's the one answer. So you can study in the US. So a brick and mortar animation thing like the Academy of Art where I teach or if you want to do without a degree, but the animation collaborative, which is awesome. Um, so that wouldn't work. So you have to look at online schools, but I know where you're from. Um, so A, look at your schools where you're from, where maybe they have something there. Um, or you go online and then you got Animation Mentor. I teach there, so that's why I'm mentioning that first. But you have Anim School, Anim Squad, I Animate, uh, CGTarian. I mean, there's so many schools that are online. Um, it really depends on 
again the style like there, there might after a while there are some styles that kind of come out of certain schools so i would just look at their show reels so i would look at online schools their show reels and look at maybe you have a preference towards certain rigs because each, each school each school has different rigs too so maybe you're also drawn to that so look at the look look at what the students produce um look at the type of class that are being taught look at the type of uh, professionals that are teaching there maybe you prefer a certain company and there are a lot of schools that have a specific funneling of specific uh company uh, employees so maybe you like that style more so I, it's a hard question to answer because it's very specific it's very personal to you so i would look at again the list of schools uh who's teaching there how much it costs how long the program is um since you can't uh like since as you said you can't come to the us um Shameless self-plug, if you can't afford a school for now, maybe you gotta save up uh, at a later point, I do offer the workshops. I'm sure since you're watching this, you're aware of my workshops, but they are cheaper and I try to keep it low for that reason um, so that people can afford it. So it's 500 bucks for 16 submissions. So it's not 16 weeks, submissions whenever you're ready. So again, shameless self-plug, but that's why I have it. Um, so you can't afford this or you have a, a different schedule or it's between semesters, between um, online schools, then you can take that workshop and you can always pause whenever you want and resume later. Um, so these will be, I don't know, my suggestions and um, this is very personal. So you gotta look at what works best for you. All right, thanks. All right, next up we have Karim, Karim, Karim N. Sorry, again, pronouncing, I hope it's all okay. What if I need plan to do some body mechanics shots like the animation schools did do? Hold on. What if I need plan to do some body mechanics shots like animation schools did? Do you have something like that in your workshops and 16 week enough for me to be advanced level in body mechanics or I need more for move to the next level, to next level? All right, all right. So let me unpack this. And I already responded um, to this, but it's for people who are seeing, seeing this or are seeing this for the first time. Um, so yes, technically my workshop will cover whatever you want. So if you are at a bouncing ball level, and I will go through that. If you are advanced acting, I will go through that. If you show me storyboards, you wanna plan out something for a short, I've done it as well. If it's a demo reel analysis and suggestion of what you need to make it better, subjectively, uh, I can do that too. Now, this, the 16 weeks is just, most people submit once a week. And that's why I say 16 weeks. But you can, be, you can submit twice a week, and so it's just eight weeks. You can submit once a week, and then maybe it takes you three weeks to implement the updates and then you submit again and then it only takes you one week and then it takes you four weeks it takes you two days you know what i mean so i'm looking at it in terms of 16 submissions so if you do it once a week that's 16 weeks but if you have something and you implemented the notes in two days why wait more days to submit just because it's once a week so that's what i'm saying if you implemented the notes after two days well then submit the update and then i will continue so it's generally 16 submissions um now, will you be advanced enough to get to the next level? That's a hard question to answer because, and this is for anybody that is considering applying, I don't know how good you are. I don't know what your level is. Even if you show me your reel, I don't know how long it took you. You know what I mean? Like people have shots that are fantastic, but then you hear, took me six months. Like, well, and that's even, uh, even that is not clear because it's six months nonstop, and then you're kind of potentially slow. Or is it six months you did an hour a week? That's also, you know, there's a difference there. Um, so it just really all depends on your workflow, how fast you are, how quickly you learn. Um, hopefully my my teaching style or my notes will help you learn, but, but maybe it's not clear enough, and then we're gonna have a dialogue, and then it's emails, and then I don't consider that as a, as a submission. Then we just email and see what's best for you. So it's kind of tricky. So for anybody listening, considering this, I can't promise that you're gonna get to the next level. I have people that submit the same shot for 16 weeks, and then I have people that submit multiple shots for 16 weeks or 16 submissions, um, either because they're fast or they just have a different workflow. I don't know, it just really, that's again a very personal um, situation, so I can't really promise. All I can promise is I'm gonna do my best to give you very honest notes, and even if they're picky, and I might just not final shot because I'm very picky, because I wanna get you to the next level. That's my goal, to get you to the next level, where I critique things based on kind of industry standards of that's the quality level I want you to be at. Now, again, this is up to you. Do you wanna hear picky notes for 16 submissions? You know what I mean? It's just, it's just up to you, but that's kind of my answer uh, to you specifically and people who are um, considering applying uh, to my workshop. All right, Adam Gillespie, 
What advice or exercises would you give for students who've recently completed an animation school, like Animation Mentor, and want to keep practicing or don't feel job ready yet? What I would recommend um, is to take a look at all your shots, make a reel, and then you have to submit that for feedback. Again, you can send it to me or send it you know, to those. Um, again, I said that before, I have a link to forums. Or I would just submit your reel and say, what do you guys think? And then you can get feedback in terms of, I have five shots in my reel, but this shot doesn't quite cut. It's just, it's the worst out of all of them. Let me replace that one, which could be a performance shot or a weight shot, and then make something better than put that in your reel. So what I would recommend um, is just kind of taking a look at what do you have? What's the worst shot in your reel? And then replace that. And in terms of exercises, like I said before, body mechanics have to be really solid. Pantomime without the aid of uh, audio are really solid. Um, performance with audio has to be really solid and then uh, variety if, if your rigs are always um, you know what if you have only female rigs and the character looks like they're 20 years old and you got five shots like that that's kind of boring so add some some male rigs in there vice versa but if you have male and female well are they all the same like 20 to 30 years old is anybody like 80 years old that your mechanics and your acting is gonna to be totally different or do you have a kid that's let's say five obviously the behavior of a five-year-old is going to be totally different um compared to someone that's 20. so i would look at that again variety so i would look at your reel what's your variety level at and then see what you can do to supplement um your shots in that aspect uh and specific exercises uh you know again lip sync mechanics uh sh I'll, main thing i would put in would be something where there's a thought process so it's not just movement but there are plenty of shots and if you are following me on twitter when i retweet things i retweet a ton of shots that are purely mechanics and they're fantastic so i'm not saying that they're wrong but you got to be at that level you know what i mean if it's just movement and the shot is kind of eh then it's kind of eh overall but if it's just movement but the quality is super high obviously i'm stating the obvious then it's a super cool shot but if you have thought process I don't know, to me there's something about seeing a character think and make choices that is also just really interesting and just to me just, the character comes alive so i can absolutely appreciate super high polished mechanics but if it's something that grabs me emotionally because of a character choice uh, and an acting choice it's just something to it um so i would at least have that balance right something with a thought process something where the character has to make choices so they face a certain conflict um, but definitely supplement it with body mechanics. And again, this can be martial arts dancing, which I always kind of rant about. But if they're really well done, then obviously you can still show off the polish and the mechanics um, skills that you have. This chair is killing me, killing me. So um, that would be my advice. Now, again, put that stuff online so you get feedback. Because you can't, like I said before, animate in a vacuum because you don't know how it's going to like you think it's great and then you can submit it for people for feedback and then you get horrible feedback <laughs> maybe you know what i mean um you can always submit it to the 11 second club where you get feedback so do those different things look for a variety look at what your reel has and doesn't have submit to forums so you actually get feedback right and then iterate on that on those uh, comments and that's kind of it hope that helped all right one piece by isobar isobar isobare i don't know hello sir how are you i am good thank you so much for all you do for us you're very welcome why don't you do the workshops workshop only about body mechanics and other one about acting it can be really nice god bless you continue i will continue um thank you for your blessings and i'm not going to do workshops specifically you know for just body mechanics or just acting i'm doing my workshop specifically tailored to the animator that submits work so if someone needs help in just body mechanics, I will help that person with that. If someone needs help with performance, I will try to do that. But I'm not going to say, here, pay 500 bucks and all you do is body mechanics. Like, I don't know. Like, you, there are schools for that that teach specific courses just for that. And I want to do something where I help each animator specifically. And if they want to switch it up between the workshop, in the workshop between mechanics and acting, you know, like, I want to make it sure it works for that animator specifically if that makes sense right so i'm no i'm not going to do that i just want to cover everything based on what the care what the uh the animator needs all right martin p thank you mister looking forward to the year 12 oh yeah right <laughs> crack me up that's a that's a long time so uh i'm not gonna be that old but thank you though uh appreciate it there's no question yes i want to say thank you and thank you for um uh, being appreciative and thank you for commenting and that means you watch it so I want to say thank you 
All right, Henry Soren. I am curious about how much animation you did a day when you were a student. How did you balance it with watching films and studying other filmmaking techniques? I've heard before some animators aiming for 12 hours a day when they were in school. You know, that's a good question and it's very, very specific to what you're able to do, capable to do, comfortable to do. So the thing is, so how much did I do? I can't remember because I thought about this when you, when you, uh, when you post that question, when you commented there, because I had other classes and I was also like the first two years at the academy, mostly like most of the years, I, I graduated after I think three and a half years and my animation classes were basically fall and then spring and then I graduated. But I did spring uh, first Maya class and then summer for Maya too. So there was still like once that started in Maya, I, I worked a lot on that. Not that it was animation specifically, but I did work a lot. Um, I don't know if it was 12 hours a day, but I definitely was also out with friends and I was watching movies and I was out, you know, doing things. So it's not just animation. So it's a hard question to answer. I can't really remember. I do remember that towards the end, I was definitely animating a lot. I don't know if it was 12 hours a day because you still have to go to class and you got to walk to class and come back. You still have lunch and dinner. Uh, <laughs> So I don't know, that's a that's a long time. I really don't remember. I know I spent a lot of time animating towards the end, for sure. But even when I graduated and it was just animating at home, maybe 12 hours is a long day. I mean, even at work, I work really long hours at work when that's approved. So overtime is approved. So I work as long as I get paid. I know it sounds very arrogant, but I don't work for free. I don't wanna work for free. So if I provide my services, I want to get compensated for that. And I have no problem working a ton of hours as long as I'm, as long as I'm getting paid for it. And as long as I'm physically fit to do that. And as long as it's not compromising my family and the quality of life. So to me, there's always a big balance between a lot of work and a lot of downtime and recovering. Uh, and I do want to do a Q&A, a Q and a, a Q &A, an F &A about burnout. Because a lot of people comment on burnout and I see burnout mentioned everywhere. Uh, and I've never really burnt out mainly because I'm really trying hard to have that balance where I'm just super lazy and do nothing and just recharge or just watch a ton of movies. And that to me is just relaxing and watch movies without observing them, uh, you know, exercise and go play some sports and go on vacation. I mean, again, it all depends on what you're able to do and financially able to do. So I'm, I'm aware of that, but I try to have a very, very um, tough look at myself in terms of balance. So I don't know. I don't know if I worked that long, even at school, I tried to be balance in that aspect. It wasn't as focused and self-aware enough, but I was still not overworking myself to, you know, to get carpal tunnel and, and just and body problems with it. Uh, because I do use a pen and I use a, a, a marble mouse at work. Uh, and now I got standing, hold on here. <laughs> I have a desk that goes up and down. Um, so even at home, this is a recent installation, which is very expensive, but um, so I try to be balanced in terms of health and work. So maybe you need 12 hours a day. Like, I don't know. Again, this is one of those where I can't really answer this. Um, I remember someone at school asking me, how many hours do they need to sleep in order to get an A in my class? Strange. My answer was, well, you got to sleep until you're rested. Like don't sleep just two or three hours because other people are doing that. You need six to eight hours of sleep. Like people survive at, uh, Six, the ideal is eight, so they say. Um, I'm just, you know, maybe you can survive with six. I wouldn't go below six, to be honest. Like, you need sleep, you need to recover. And if you're tired and you're overworked, you'll animate slower. So your progress actually will be crappier. Um, so yeah, I'm trying to figure out an answer for this, but I don't know, my balance was just basically, I'm, I don't drink coffee. Like I don't try to keep myself awake. I also don't, don't like coffee. I like the, the, the smell of it. I just don't like the taste. Um, but when I'm tired, I go to sleep. So sometimes you would work late into the night, but then I would sleep in. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. To me, it was always kind of, I was okay with the balance. Um, there was definitely balance between working and having a lot of fun and drinking and eating and stuff. Um, and now having a family, I just work and then I stop working and I just spend time with my six-year-old, you know, playing, building Legos or just recently when we went on a hike. Um, you know, like I try to do stuff where I just don't do anything. That being said, I was on a hike and I took photos. I'm still kind of doing something, but that to me is relaxing and is the balance. So I don't know. I don't know if this is helpful at all. Um, 
I would just say when you when you hear other animators aiming for 12 hours, just know that everybody has their own process, their own workflow, their own health issues or not, uh, and their own, um, you know, they're able to do certain things that you can't or you're better than others in some other areas. It's just all very specific to who you are. So I would just listen to yourself. If you're tired and you're overworked, stop. And then take, take a break and don't force it. You're going to hurt your eyes. You're going to hurt your wrists. Your process will be slower anyway. So my main answer to this is I don't quite remember. I know I worked a lot, but I know I also did a lot of stuff outside of work uh, as a student as well. I do the same thing as, prof as a professional sets as, uh, as I'm working for a company, I do the same thing. Um, and even when I do my shots at home, like I have, like for instance, the that pigeon shot that I did like, like five years ago, I remember I think doing nine to 10 hours a day, like on the weekend. I think I remember that. Mainly because I don't want to go 12, 15, 16 hours because I'm trying to stay within like a work day, nine to 10 hours. Uh, and then just relax and again you need rest and then attack the shot the next day so even now i'm really old now really old now i'm just tired uh i wouldn't be able to do like full on at home because i want to rest and i don't want to you know i would do it if i'm alone at home let's say if my, if my family is out for whatever reason vacation by themselves and i'm here then i might consider 12 hours if i'm recording a demo or something i can really get into it and be in the groove um but other than that i would just i just take a lot of i take a lot of breaks i don't know that's a very long answer. I hope it's somewhat helpful. All right. Now, Kaushal Magodia. Again, Magodia, I hope that I, I pronounced this uh, correctly. I have a very academically inclined question. So my question is, I have finished character animation one, character two, and advanced character animation. I even finished Pixar class, uh, Pixar one class. What should I do in the spring, which is animation related? Any suggestions would do, I already commented on that, but for anybody listening and uh, uh, wondering about that. I would just do anything that lets you animate. This is a very super super broad and useless question uh, or answer. It's basically, I'm a big proponent of practice makes perfect. Now you gotta know what to practice, obviously. You can just do the same thing that's wrong. But if you can take another class, um, you know, then do something that's animation related in terms of maybe it's a storyboarding class or animation history. So you just kind of broader education, but you can do into filmmaking or lighting, you know, like whatever it helps you as a filmmaker. But then at, at home, uh, continue with exercises. So what should I do in the spring, which is animation related? Just animate, right? If you can't take a class, take classes related to that field. Or not, or maybe just take a class sculpting, something that's just interesting to you and, and it's a mental break and you just, you know, you expand your skill set and, and your interests. Um, but you can still animate at home. So my main answer would be, what should I do that's animation related? Just animate practice and then keep it short so you can iterate on different things don't do a 20 second shot just keep something short and then just practice practice uh you know sit downs and get ups and throws and lifts and pushes and and then takes animation takes and, and thought process and a reaction and gear change and i would just that's my main thing you just gotta i feel like i got better because i'm animating every day because i'm at work and because i'm doing things all the time it's just such a repetition aspect of it that it just, uh, I don't know, there's something like muscle memory in terms of animation, muscle memory. Um, that's my take on it. Now, does that work for you? I don't know. Again, all those questions are very specific to people. So that's my suggestion. Try it. If it doesn't work out, you got to try something else, obviously. Such a obvious answers. Um, and that's very class specific, but I answered that uh, in the comments. So continuing on. My two 501st, sounds very Star Warsy. Uh, oh my God, 2019 gonna be huge, I hope so, I have plans. So here's three questions. Question one, I saw a video, you told us how to pronounce your name, but I forgot which video it is. So can you tell me how to pronounce your name again? Technically, it's Jean Denis. Jean Denis, there's a hyphen. Jean Denis is my first name, Haas is my last name. Uh, it's not Jean. <laughs> so you can say JD or Jean Denis, but it's not Jean. Do you have any recommendations to learn real acting like theater plays because I want to learn it theoretically to observe the natural behavior? Um, I don't. So recommendations to have real acting. So the thing is, there's a difference between theater acting, movie acting, and animation acting. So I would look at, if you wanna, if you wanna learn this, I would say take theater classes, right? 
uh, so you can learn that aspect because how you act in front of an audience, uh, you know, further away, you project your voice, your your moves are bigger. It's just different, different technique to it. Versus if you do movie where you have maybe a wide shot, but you get a close up, you're gonna kind of tone it down and be more subtle. It's just I don't know, they're totally different um, techniques to it. And then of course animation, you go frame by frame again, it's all different. So recommendations to learn real acting, uh, quote unquote real acting. Um, it's just different techniques. Immerse yourself in that. So theater plays, you know, just, I don't know. I, I'm not versed in theater plays. So you would have to find someone maybe that teaches that or uh, attend theater and then maybe ask the actors there or the directors there, or the stage directors, uh, how they went about that. So, um, but you say you want to learn it theoretically. See, the thing is, there's only so much you can read. Um, when I can, someone, I don't know if it's in here, but someone asked me about the books that I read about animation. I, I have a, a list of things that I read, but the thing is, you, you can only read so much. You gotta do it, you gotta practice. It's like reading about six packs. You can't, you can read about exercise as long as you want, but you're not gonna get fit, right? So you gotta do it. So that's kind of my, my somewhat lame answer there. Um, I heard many great animators said, Charlie Chaplin's works are everything for animation. I saw his movies then, I totally loved them, but I can't describe why they are so good. I can feel it though. To me, they're great just because his control over his body and the body acting and the storytelling that's so clear with his body, gestures and moves and Buster Keaton and uh, Mr. Bean. I mean, there's so many more, but I love them just because there is there is no audio in terms of him saying something or explaining what he does. It's all through his facial express, uh, expressions and body behavior and body acting and pantomime. That's why I love um, Keaton and Chaplin and Mr. Bean and all those. They're, just, they're so great. Um, but again, that's that's why I like them. Your acting analysis videos are very important for me to study acting. Um, thanks, but you know, I don't. They're great for acting. It's very specific in terms of what I pick out, though. Um, I still don't know how to analyze acting by myself. Is there any points to look at the acting? How do you train your eyes to analyze it? Am I not talented enough? Maybe. I don't think you're not talented it's because if you're not there yet, it's because of practice. You just haven't done it enough. Um, when I was watching movies as a kid, I didn't look at that that way. I just felt like, eh, or yay, in terms of did I like the movie or not. But the more you, the more I learn about filmmaking uh, in terms of composition and color and edits and, and, and acting, um, the more I learn, the more I understand, I think I do, maybe. And then I look at what other people say about their craft uh, and then kind of learn through that. Um, it's definitely a lot of repetition where I start to see patterns and things where like, oh, that's cool because they did that and someone else did that before that and, and so on. So for me, it's how do I train it? Like, I don't know if I'm good at it. You know what I mean? Like I post my acting analysis because this is stuff that I like. Um, some people comment they like it as well. But I wouldn't say that I'm, you know, an acting teacher. Like, I, I'm still a massive student when it comes to that. Um, so how do you train? I just watch a lot and, I, and I, I respond to things that I like. And then I try to research uh, how do people prepare. And there's a master class online uh, where they talk about that craft. There are, like I said, a couple books. Um, so I kind of look at what people are teaching and saying, and I, I, I watch interviews with actors. Um, there is a um, there is a YouTube channel. So I cut something out because I had to look it up and it was boring for anybody to watch, right? But there is the Off Camera Show. That's the channel, uh, and they have more on their on their on Netflix actually and on their site. But it's it's um, there are a lot of interviews with actors um, and other creative you know minded people. So they talk about their craft and the aspect and and their process of, of acting sometimes. Um, so I watch that for sure. Uh, I used to watch Inside the Actor Studio a lot um, before I cut cable. Uh, so they talk about acting there. So I mean to me, I try to just expose myself to that process. Uh, and hopefully I learn something from it and then I apply that to my to my analysis clips and hopefully it makes sense. Um, I know sometimes I look at things and go like, oh, this is really cool because of this. And then you, I talk to someone else about that shot and go like, oh no, I thought it was that. And it's like a lot of things that I think are very subjective. So I might interpret something that's totally different or totally wrong and not what the director actor intended. So I don't know. Again, it's one of the, my rambling non-answers, but... Um, that would be it. I do also like to look at uh, um, just a wide range of movies to get just different takes on acting. And sometimes you're like, that was a bit broad. I don't know if it was bad acting. I would say I can be better, but maybe that was too broad for something that I would use in the shot. But then maybe for that movie it was appropriate and it was right. Um, so I don't know. I would say watch a lot of things, 
uh, and read up where we can, where people who do it explain their process. Um, and I do have a list of books and I'm going to post that in the description as well. I replied that to that clip where I asked about uh, question submits, but um, I have certain books that I've read and I'm going to do actually reviews on these as well. Um, but yeah, that's my long answer. Thank you for reading my bad English. It's not bad at all. You save me every time you upload videos. That's very kind of you. I hope you have a great year. Me too. Thank you. And you too. I hope you have a great year too. Bijoy, 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 Pandey. Again, I apologize for butchering anything. Hey, I have a question. How are you doing? Have a great year. Thank you. That's a good question. I'm actually great. I'm just tired, to be honest. Uh, if you've watched my recent clips, especially this year, you can see that the rings under my eyes are getting... Someone commented that I look tired too. Uh, I just, I'm just i tired mainly because uh, my six-year-old had a few more nightmarish nights where he just wakes up at night. And of course, it wakes me up and then I help him and then I can't sleep or it takes me a while to fall asleep. Um, but it's mainly when it's cold, the dog that we have is very loud. He wakes up and do, does things and jumps into our bed and and we, we try to crate train him when he was a puppy and it's just, it never really worked as a beagle. It's a very just comfort. Like he likes, he, he likes to be around people in like his pack. And we tried so many things and it just, the, he just has to be in the same room as us. I know anybody who has a beagle goes, no, you could train it. I know you could, but right now we can't. Like it, this, is the, this is the current situation. And when we put him in a different room or a kennel or something in a crate, then he just starts yapping because he's just sad. And at four or five in the morning, whoop, and it wakes me up and it wakes you know the kids up and so we've gone through process different things of having it in our room and it's, it kind of works and it doesn't work works and doesn't work um and during the summer it's a lot better because he just sleeps but now it's cold and he wakes up and he's cold and he wants to get into our bed and he whines and just the last couple of months it's been tricky um also my wife is going i know she i don't say what she has to pee a lot i know it's very very inappropriate um but you know like i also wake up and have to go pee if i drink too much but i drink a lot of water when i try to exercise and I drink a lot of water so like one of us is going to wake up and then go to the bathroom that's going to wake someone else up and then the dog wakes up so last couple months have been tricky to get a full night's sleep so i'm doing fine i just like i would like to sleep more uninterrupted so that's my long answer. So if anybody's wondering why I look tired, that's why. <laughs> and when I switched the guest room downstairs just a couple a couple of days ago, and I slept seven hours uninterrupted, um, and it was great. You feel so different, obviously. Um, so lately it's been like four to five hours, sometimes three hours, and then I wake up and then I go back to sleep. So it's been tough. So we're trying to find something. I'm also getting older. I have to say. It's been a while since I exercised on a regular basis. I've been eating a lot lately again. That doesn't help, right? So I have ways and I got uh, some ideas in terms of what can I do to, uh, you know, be healthier um, and uh, get back to proper sleep. So thanks for asking. And if anybody's wondering why I look tired, that's why. I love my dog though. He's super cute. All right, let's move on. Abdul Fahim. To be a good animator, thumbnail sketching is essential because I am very, very bad sketching. Is it necessary to sketch thumbnails or can we make thumbnails with pics or anything else or skip that part? It's a good question. My answer is always, you can make it work without being able to draw. That being said, I think you'd be better if you can draw. I can't. And I think it would benefit a lot. And I got a ton of drawing books, which I've never opened. This goes back into my books of uh, my reviews uh, of books, but that is painful because I've never actually used them but I would like to I would like to to go back into learning because I, I used to be I wasn't good at school either but I, I like it a lot I like to draw as always in the Q&A's when I answer this I like to do it I'm just not good at it so I don't do thumbnails because my, my drawings confuse me like, I don't know what I'm drawing here so for me the sketching aspect is I shoot reference or uh, I shoot reference and then maybe select certain frames from that reference or I just act things out um, so for me it's more acting it out on my own and then um, just kind of the feel of it and kind of being aware of the movement uh, and looking at reference and studying that. So that's my process. So I haven't been fired yet. I haven't been laid off yet. It's been 15 years, tomorrow 15 years. Uh, so I would say it's it's doable. I know people who don't sketch and they're good animators and it works. <clears throat> but if I want to be honest with myself, I would say I would be better. I think I could be better if I do my drawings and I have better drawing skills and just for posing and, um, and then I could do a quick blocking in 2D, grease pencil or whatever tool you use, I think I will benefit from it. 
So it's possible you can do it, but I think it's helpful if you can thumbnail. Um, so you can skip it if, you, if you're not able to do it. And I think you still have a great career as an animator, um, but if you want to expand your skill set and get better at things, uh, I think being able to sketch in, even just like basic human forms uh, would be a good idea. And I'm telling that myself. <clears throat> All right, Brandon Berry CG. Ooh, ooh, question. Will your upcoming facial animation video cover a more in-depth look into eye and mouth shape in animation? It's quite a tricky subject to find information on. Absolutely. I have a ginormously long email that I sent students. I've just finished this recently, but I have more things I want to cover. Uh, and also I want to make sure that if I bring up those examples that are in that email that I credit the artist and maybe I, I kind of replace it with my own animation and examples. So there's a lot to do to make this uh, YouTube ready, so to speak, to kind of show it. Um, but yes, I will definitely cover a lot because it's a, it's a heavenly, heav heavily asked uh, uh, request thing here on, the, on YouTube. But it's also something we cover in class a lot, like uh, be mentored academy. Uh, and I wanted to compile that email for the students so they have something like a cheat sheet to go on. So I will definitely convert that into something that is YouTube uh, appropriate in terms of the visuals and blah, blah, blah. But yes, that is coming and it will be as detailed as possible. All right. Deepak Dubey. Dubey? Dubey. I fear that if I don't animate for two months, I will forget about everything. Animation is that for everyone. You know, um, it really, I don't know, this, again, it's a very subjective question. It depends how, for how long you've been animating. If I would just start school and then not animate for two months, yes, I'll probably forget things and it would be tricky to keep going and you would feel very insecure about your skills. For me now, if I don't animate for two months, it would be fantastic. What a, what a break, a mental break. Uh, and I don't think I would have problems getting back. It might be rusty the first week of, you know, but I don't know, like if you do it for, for years, it's not something you forget. Your 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 skills are still there. Your training is still there, and your experiences are still there. So I think the longer you animate, uh, long breaks would be a real problem. But I, I can see that if you're just starting out, it might be it might be tricky, even two months. Um, so I can't really answer that. People who this chair, people who have gone through this, I mean, you might as well comment and let him know. Um, I don't think it will be a problem. And sometimes you gotta, like I said, you gotta take a break to just recover from things. Um, just keep going and it's gonna be like riding a bike if you ride a bike. Uh, it, just, it might be wobbly at the beginning, but you get back on and it will be fine. Adalberto Nivar. First question, where is if <laughs> It's coming. Just kidding, let's build some good questions. By the way, Happy New Year. Jean is Jolini or JD. Uh, but thank you. Thank you for watching. Uh, I just wanted to post that just because that person commented and took time to comment. So thank you. Uh, and I believe that is the last one here. Trevor Mazaglia? Mazaglia? Butchering names. Hey JD, you mentioned in a previous video that when you were starting out, your goals was to get hired at either ILM or Pixar. While both studios create top quality animation work, the styles are very different. My question is, has there ever been a point where you wanted to switch to feature animation like Pixar? What has kept you in VFX for over 10 years or is it 15 yet? It is 15 tomorrow. Thanks and love the channel. Thank you for watching it. Um, that's a great question. And so, yes, let me go one by one here. Um, I mean, my goal was to get hired wherever. <laughs> so uh, ILM and Pixar were the dream companies. But obviously any company is fine because you need a job and and so many other companies do great work. So it wasn't it wasn't like I'm not going to accept the job anywhere unless it's those two. It wasn't that. But I think it's important to have goals and you want to work towards those goals. Uh, and then those goals are very subjective. So, uh, you know, so many people have different companies in mind or different styles or whatever it is. Right. So but yes, those were um, the ones mainly because ILM was I'm a kid from the 80s. I'm born uh, in the 70s. So all the, you know, Indiana Jones and Star Wars and Back to the Future and Ghostbusters and I don't know, like, there's so many movies with effects done by ILM that shaped my childhood and especially my viewing habits um, that I, I would have loved to work uh, at ILM. And I'm very happy that I that I got that chance, that I'm, I'm still there. So that was always my big thing. But then as you grow older, and for me, I'm realizing that I'm not a master draftsman. I'm not going to be, uh, you know, a 2D animator at Disney. So way back then, 2D was still there. Um, I never really thought I can draw well enough to be a 2D animator. 
But then when Pixar came along, it's like, oh, computer animation, maybe that's easier. Like, I have no idea, right? Maybe that's easier. Uh, and I love Toy Story, and I still love it. it. It's such a good movie, especially Toy Story 2, which I love. Uh, actually, 3 as well. They're all really good. I love those characters. So to me, it was just, oh, you can do this. You don't have to draw. Even though I just said before, thumbnailing would be helpful, and I should learn to draw. That That's why I had ILM Pixar. So many other companies were great, um, but that was just the first one to really bring that movie out with Toy Story. So for me, that was just, oh, that's the company. Now, since then, there are other companies, obviously. Um, but way back then, when CG just came out, it was Pixar. So that's why it was ILM Pixar. My question is, has there ever been a point where you wanted to switch? Yes, because every now and then, the industry goes up, up and down, especially with VFX, the summer is slow in terms of work, because all the blockbusters come out May, April, May, something like that, right? Um, so it's a bit tricky having enough work. So you always kind of go through ups and downs, and then you worry. You worry about getting laid off because there's no work. So I always had, my eyes open looking at other companies just in case. I'm a big proponent of plan Bs. You never know what's gonna happen. Uh, I've been a bit too relaxed lately because I don't have a reel. I got my ILM reel, which I don't have a reel. I have the shots, but I never edited a reel together. Um, and I definitely don't have a cartoony shot uh, reel, uh, performance reel like for cartoony companies. So I gotta get back into that. But. Because of that, because of the the, uh, the idea of you gotta be prepared just in case something happens, I was definitely looking, uh, because you never know. Now, would I like to switch this in general? Yes, for sure. I love performance and I love acting and I love cartoon animation. So having the chance to work at a, at a feature company would be fantastic. Now, after 15 years at ILM, it's tricky because A, I have zero experience in terms of feature animation, professional experience of I've gone through a full project. So resume wise, that's a problem. So if you have 15 years of VFX and you apply to cartoony animation, it's a bit of a problem. Also after 15 years, I'm not cheap. Uh, I make a lot of money, dare I say, right? And especially compared to other people, like other people make more money than me, but I think given what I have, what I spend and what, you know, with the family and the house, I'm not poor and I, I do really well. So with my 15 years, there comes a price tag, right? So if I would apply now for Cartoonia company, A, zero experience. Uh, it would all be at home clips that I need to do now, right? They need to start. Uh, there's a certain price tag that comes with, um, with me applying somewhere. And also if they would give me less money, I may or may not be able to, to accept it. Not because how dare they not compensate for my skill set says, no, I'm also locked, this is my fault, into a certain, you know, I gotta pay my bills. So if I can't pay my bills, that's a problem. Now, obviously those are my problems and I decided to do this and have a house and the bills go up. So I'm not gonna say, I want more money because I want a company to be able to pay for my bills. I mean like this, it's not it's not their fault that I have bills, but that's my pragmatic look at it. Like if, if I apply somewhere and they don't pay me enough and I can't pay my bills, well, that doesn't work even though I might like the offer and I might like the company, I gotta pay my bills. It just comes down to, to that, right? So years of experience um, or lack of experience, right? So the real would have nothing professional, that's a problem. Um, and then the the price, and then I have to look at, mostly because I'm old, I might apply somewhere. Let's, let's pretend I would apply somewhere that's cartoony and they actually would like me and would uh, pay me and uh, accept me. I look at things also like commute, right? If, if I have to go somewhere and it's awesome, but the commute is two hours, that's a problem. Now you might say, well, you know, get the fuck out of here. Uh, you, you suck it up and you just do that because you got that chance to work there. I totally understand. But you know, is that commute time taking away so much time from the family? So I end up just commuting and working and I'm never home with my family. Like, I don't wanna do this. Now, if you're young and you're single, that might be totally different. And you, there are certain things that you can accept um, in terms of uh, sacrifice, right? This is very dramatic. But you might be able to do that. For me personally, at this point, and I'm 41, I don't wanna do that. I don't wanna commute for two, three hours. So I would have to look at, well, then we need to move so that the commute is shorter. So I still have the work-life balance and I can be home enough, right? So, but then you would have to sell the house, find a new house. There's just a lot of stuff that comes with those um, decisions. And the longer you work at a company, the older you get and the more money you make and the less of a different reel you have, like the less choices I have, basically. So would I want to switch? Yes, it just, but it comes down to a lot of factors. Now, that being said, I've also been at ILM because I love it. I love the company. 
the feet the, like sometimes you have projects that might not be as cool sure but then the people you work with are fantastic and that's my main thing why i stay there at first it was it's ilm it's great star wars it's great and it was very project based but then after a while i realized but i had so much fun being with this group of people that i want to be with the animators there like i like the animators there so then it's not about the project it's about i want to be with those people and then that's kind of how it evolved where i just like being around the people at ilm it's just a lot of fun and i laugh every day there i always say when i talk about work on on the channel here i just laugh every day it's great now it changes it goes up up there up and downs in terms of project right sometimes you work more sometimes you work less sometimes there are scares about layoffs um so you just never know there's always a certain um you know uncertainty with with vfx companies but i love the people and that's mainly why i stayed there that being said i have applied uh, multiple companies when i graduated right and then six months after working at ilm actually story time i got an email from pixar saying pixar checking i still remember that and they they were interested uh i'm assuming at least talking to me it, it, it didn't say we want to hire you it just said pixar checking in because they saw my reel but that was six months into working at ilm where they had my work visa and it was in the middle of star wars so I said no, because I can't just abandon the project halfway through. They pay for my work visa, which is way too complicated. Um, and I liked it there. And I said, sorry, I can't I can't switch. I'm hired there and this is my contract length and so on and so on. And they said, no problem. Just let us know when you're done, which I did. But the thing is, after I was done and then said, hey, I'm ready, time has passed. So then the reel was not good anymore. You know what I mean? Like as time goes on, reels get better and better. So my quality when back then was okay. It wasn't good enough. So then, you know, I submit something new. So then for actually a couple of years, I tried to do my shots at home and, and I actually reapply a couple times. And it was always kind of playing catch up where uh, I didn't have, because you work all day and then you get home and then you, own, you do your own shots. It's tricky. And again, because of work-life balance, um, so I personally think I never put in enough time. Now, that's my excuse, but I might also not be good enough to work at Pixar. So it was always kind of this catch up where the reel was never really good enough. Until one point, um, I think through an internal uh, uh, referral, they I got an interview there and I was shocked because the reel was very unfinished. It was a lot of work in progress stuff. And actually I had uh, Star Wars stuff in it, like stunt double things where it's character animation, but it's not cartoony. So I was, I was surprised that they wanted to see it. And when I went through the interview process, most comments were, this is a short reel, which it was, it was really short. And it was not really cartoony enough, especially, especially variety wise. And it had the ILM stuff in it. So again, I was very surprised, but it was a very interesting experience. And there was some interesting things where not naming names, but it's, I remember one person in the room, because you have a lot of people in, in that process that go in and out, and there's people come in and come out and ask you questions. I remember one person staying in the back, look at me all the time like this, and after like half an hour or something, it was maybe like 10 minutes or so, that person said, do you think you can do this? And it just cracked me up. So for anybody asking questions, I have gone through some interviews at work where I interview people to get hired. It's a funny question, come on. When you say, can you do this? Either you say, no, I can't. And then you go, well, why are you here? Or you say, Yes, I think I can do this. And then you you sound arrogant. So it was just a weird question, but kind of the diplomatic thing was, and it's that was an honest answer. It's like, yes, I think I can do this, but it's going to take me some time to acclimate to a different style. And I might not be as good as other people and not might be, I'm definitely not as good as other people. So there will be a transitional period. Uh, and then it's up to, you know, people at the company to evaluate me to see if I'm actually good enough to stay on the project and at the company. Just a funny question to ask. But anyway, I think I royally screwed up that interview because I had no idea uh, why I was there. I wasn't told this is for this in this project. So I, my, <laughs> when I went in, I thought it was going to be for a movie. So when at the very end, I think it was like an hour long interview. And I don't know if I'm supposed to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. This is the end of the Q&A. No one's listening anyway, right? At the very end, I think it was like five minutes before the end. Someone asked me, do you know why you're here? And I said, no, I don't know. I was just asked to come. And they say, oh, you're here to do uh, animation for a Finding Nemo ride. And it's three months, project only, and then you're not going to stay, you're going to get laid off, and then that's it. And the moment I heard that, it was over for me. Mainly because I would have to quit ILM 
And during three months, I can't work on real during three months because I want to concentrate on, on working there. So to me, it was already, I can't do this because if I'm laid off after three months, which that what it's what they said was a three months thing, I don't really have a real to um, apply somewhere else. And I believe back then I was still on a work visa. Now I don't know, but thinking back, it's been it's been some time. Like I definitely had issues with, well, if I get laid off, will I find another job? And then can I pay my bills? I don't remember again if I was married already and I had a green card. I really can't remember. I need to check. Um, but that's, those type of questions went right into my brain and, and I reacted to this. And someone commented saying, oh, that's not what you wanted to hear, right? No, that's not what you expected to hear or wanted to hear. And I was just honest and I was probably too honest. I said, no, that's not. I thought this is going to be for a movie and that I would get hired. But my thought was, well, on a movie, it's probably six months or longer, which gives me more time to work on a reel. So when I'm, once I'm laid off, I can reapply somewhere else. Um, but I think the way I said it came across as, yeah, I expect it to be hired right away staff to work on a movie. I don't know. That's, I don't know. Like, who knows uh, what they thought. But that was my my thought process. And when I, when I said it, I immediately thought, oh, my God, I said this. This sounds so arrogant. Um... And then after that, it was over. It was basically it was basically that. Now that being said, everybody did comment that the sh the reel was short. Um, they did like the subtleties of what I had in in the uh, in the shop, but personally, I don't think there was enough there to to um, convince people that I was Pixar material. So my big surprise was that I had an interview at all. But my reaction <laughs> to the three months and project was so obvious. Like oh fuck, I can't do this. And I think, to me personally, my answer of uh, what I said about feature might have been interpreted as in an arrogant way of, yeah, why wouldn't you hire me full time and I'm staffed? Uh, I would love to know what they thought. I think generally my reel just wasn't good enough, to be honest. Um, and it would have been a miracle to get hired. My answer certainly didn't help. Uh, and then after that, uh, I reapplied again a couple years later. But then, then it became the point where just my shots weren't good enough, to be honest. Looking at my, my shots, they're just not... They might have been okay uh, for maybe for as a junior, but I was too old and too advanced to apply for an internship. Um, I couldn't really apply. Um, like I thought about applying, I think I did as a background animator, um, but maybe that was seen as, oh, you're just trying to get into a lower position to then become an animator. I don't know, but I think the effects people that get hired there are hired as um, background animators and then they're there as, as fixers or background animators. Maybe after a couple of years, they become a full-time animator. So I don't know. But to me, it was always kind of a catch-up thing. Uh, and it was never it was never really good enough, to be honest. Looking back at my shots, I can see why they said, listen, no, we got students from the academy or whatever that are like 10 times cheaper and they're doing better work. So back then, it was massively disappointing. And I really kicked myself for that interview and in, in how I screwed up. Uh, looking back now, objectively, look at my shots after years of, of distance, you're like, yeah, I guess. I mean, that's okay, but that's not good. And that's not quality, you know, that they had. So, that's how it goes. Disappointing, but I totally understand. Uh, but I would definitely switch if it's possible, right? It has to be a good offer that works in terms of being able to pay the bills and the commute. It's the family life. So, it's it's a very complicated answer and um, what's the word? Um, consideration at this point. Um, so I need to do my own shots at home to actually have a full cartoony reel. And it needs to be really, really, really good to convince people to not hire someone else that's younger, um, you know, with less family uh, responsibilities where I just go home and I can't stay late or don't want to stay late. The, the price is cheaper. They have more experience going through an actual feature animation pipeline and show. So there are a lot of things against me if I'm whiny. Uh, right, but um, I think it's still doable. I still think I can do it. This sounds very arrogant, but I think I'm I like animating, I like performance, I like cartoony stuff. So I do want to create a reel that's cartoony and that's really, really good. It might take me years, um, but I do want to do this, especially as a plan B, because you never know, you never know uh, how the industry is changing and you know, projects are being in other countries where I don't know how it is in the states in terms of longevity, and you see layoffs and you see all that stuff. So Bit tricky, I really, really need to work on a plan B. <clears throat> that being said, if anybody's still watching, I do have a plan B in mind uh, that I may or may not hear about soon. This is super vague and 
how dare I mention this, but there's something that might come up, uh, surprise, surprise. Uh, we shall see about that, but that will be a different upload. Um, and I think that's it. I think that is the last question. This is a very, very long Q and A. Um, who will watch the whole thing? So whoever watched this, you'll get my little insight into a, uh, an interview that I screwed up royally. Um, and that's about it. So yeah, any questions about this? Any questions about my answers or my, my confusing answers? I'd always, you can comment and I will comment in the comment section so for more clarifications. Uh, and then the next Q and A will be probably in six months, a year or something. I don't know. I got so many questions, especially from the previous Q and A that I want to do F and A's about. So, I mean, people can always comment and I can just write that down and I have a massive folder of questions from people. So I will get to all of them. Um, so the Q and A will come again, six months or a year or maybe earlier. I don't know. It depends how it goes. Right. But for now, let's, uh, let it be. Thank you for all of you that submitted questions. They're great questions. Um, again, if you're watching this, that's very, it's a very long Q and A. So thank you for watching. Uh, and that's it. Thank you.